Oh, thank you. Hello, world. What is up? Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte, and we are here live at the Build Studio in New York City. Netflix just released their crazy ambitious eight-part series, Four Years in the Making, Our Planet. Uh, The show combines jaw-dropping imagery and the latest technology for an unprecedented, never-before-filmed look at the planet. Filmed in 50 countries all across the world with over 600 members of crew capturing more than three and a half thousand filming days narrated by the man himself sir david attenborough the show is nothing short of absolutely amazing uh joining me here in just a few short moments our executive producer keith scully director and producer sophie landfair and cinematographer jamie mcpherson how about that guys i'm excited are you excited let me let me hear just a little bit about how excited you are right now i want to get a read on the excitement level Good. There was some hooting and hollering. That's fantastic. We'll bring them out here in just a second. But before we do, I believe we have a trailer for the show. So let's go ahead, run that clip. This is the story of our changing planet. And what we can do to help it thrive. Was it under the Ladies and gentlemen, make a crazy amount of noise and welcome the great Keith Scully, Sophie Lamphere, and Jamie McPherson. Come on, do it up. Come on. Uh, welcome and congratulations and thank you so much for being here and hanging out with us. Uh, it is awesome to have you guys here. I was saying downstairs, I will say it again, this, this show is absolutely incredible. Uh, thank you for making this for me to watch. Um, how are you all doing? How's life right now? How are things going? It's great to be in New York. Yeah, good. Thanks yeah. Yeah, first time in New York. So. Is it really? It's your first time? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. When did you arrive in New York officially? How long have you been in New York for your first time uh, right now? Yeah, uh, Sunday evening. Sunday evening. You've been all over the world. <laughs> first time in New York. <laughs> I, I imagine everything you've seen, nothing here surprises you at this point. <laughs> no, just you got yellow cabs. That's kind of <laughs> I was like, that's yellow cabs there. Amazing. That's the big takeaway at this point is we've got the yellow cabs. Wonderful. Well, uh, talk to me a little bit. Uh, just, you know, we, we say this over and over again, especially you read all the materials and, and you see in the trip four years in the making, so much of your, of your lives poured into this and now it's out. People are watching it. Some people are consuming it over one weekend. Some people are consuming their piecemeal. They're doing it, but people are finally seeing it and, and it's out there and they're talking about it. H- how do you feel if this thing that you poured so much into is finally out in the wild for people to share and discuss and, and marvel at? Yeah, it is slightly surreal because as you say, the buildup is for so, so long. And then suddenly it, it's all here. But it's it's a way, it's a relief because we've we've kind of known all these all these stories and and and, and um, you know you have to keep them all secret for so long. And hey, we're really bad at keeping secrets. So um, it's finally now we can sort of show the world. And and you know what's really gratifying is hearing people's reaction to things because when you live with it for so long, you get used to it and you remember it. It doesn't feel fresh. And then suddenly people talk about all sorts of things. You think, yeah, oh yeah, I remember that bit. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, no, it's 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 fantastic. That's wonderful. So, 
it's really exciting. It's amazing to have it out there finally. Like I say, we can talk about it because we haven't been able to talk about it for four years. So, <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, I just, like Keith said, just watching people's reactions to it. And amazingly, a lot of people have been watching and saying, what can they do to help? Which is exactly what we wanted, really. Um, you know, people to kind of pay attention and then do something about it. So, yeah. Well, that's one of the great parts about being so closely partnered with, with WWF and World Wildlife. Uh, because you go, to, uh, you go to the site at the end of every episode, Our Planet, and, and you see uh, there's actionable things. There's, you actually have advice. You can tell people how to help. You can, you can guide people. Because I think that's the big takeaway. Uh, and I'm sure that was the intention, was to make something that, that moves people in this direction. But yeah, you watch this. And uh, you know, I jokingly said downstairs, there's two things of Our, our Planet is Beautiful and, and how the hell did they do it. But there's a third thing, and that's how, how do I help preserve it? Because the takeaway here is these things are, are not around forever, especially the way we're behaving. You know, when, when the show was conceived, you know, let's go back four years and a, a couple of months when the idea and the seeds were first planted. Was that always the intention was we need to make a show that motivates people to, to start preserving our planet? Yeah, it absolutely was the in, the. In intention. We we've been in the business for some time and made other shows, um, you know, showing the wonder of the world. But I think all of us as filmmakers just felt the situation now is getting, you know, it's getting out of control, and we have to sort of do something. You know, the frustrating thing is that it's all very fixable, and that was the bit that I think really drove us. A lot of people think, oh well, you know, it's just in a mess. There's nothing we can do. Um, the problems we understand them. And if you understand a problem, the solution is pretty clear. And a lot of the solutions are very straightforward. So I think what we want to do is to you know, inspire people that nature is still great, it's worth keeping. But don't be put off by the fact that fixing it is, is it's pretty straightforward. We just need the will now. How does going in, as people that have, that have worked in this industry for a while and have made similar films, like you said, showcasing the wonder, how does that, uh, th this particular mission, adjust your, your approach? You know, when you're starting, when you, does it change the stories you're looking to tell, the locations you're going to go to? I imagine when, when your topic is the planet, uh, <laughs> figuring out where to start has is, is got to be a challenge. What, what is step one, and does having that mission help start to narrow the focus and figure out? Yeah, well, well so Sophie's show, um, The Frozen World, is a really good example of that. Mm. Yeah, I think um, the first show is, is a, a broad kind of overview of the planet and yeah. shows connected, but then the other... S the other shows, the other seven shows, take a habitat by habitat approach. And I think the first thing is to work out what's the key problem facing that. And it's different for each of the seven habitats. And we try to design the narrative so that you can understand how that environment works. Um, so in the Frozen Worlds episode that I made, um, it was all about the sea ice. Um, and you've got to understand that sea ice is a habitat that is like the Serengeti in a way, upside down. It's got this algae um, like the grass and then krill like the, the wildebeest and then penguins and whales that come and feed on all of that. It's an incredibly rich, productive system. Um, and then by the end of the film, you realize, well, that, that system is in peril at the top of our planet because it's of global warming and climate change and how rapidly the ice is retreating and melting. And so then by that point, you really care um, because you've seen and gone through the emotions of the animals through the film. When you get to the last part of that film, you then understand what happens, what, what the cost is when we lose it. And I think that it's, it's all the films do a similar, a similar role. You know, they go through the core message hopefully educate people how it works and then shows, you know, what we're losing. Yeah, it's just it's interesting because a lot of people just think sea ice is something polar bears need to walk on. They don't think of it as the source of the food. Right. And, and, and that's, a, that's a big misunderstanding. And, 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 and um, you know, Sophie's film just explains that. Um, and then there's obviously there's an inevitable conclusion of what we need to do to fix it. So when they were, did you like, oh, I'm going to do Frozen Worlds? Like, how did you become the person who made the Frozen Worlds film? Did you call dibs? Or were you a son? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she budgeted yeah, no, it first. Yeah, it's true. Like, I, well, I was um, asked to produce on, on Our Planet. And it was a dream job because, you know, a conservation series with conservation really at the heart of it. I was like, yes, sign me up. Um, but I was the kind of last of the table in terms of producers, and I thought, well, there's no way Frozen Worlds is going to be snapped up by someone else. And so I asked Addison Keith, said, "Please, can you make, 
please, that's my film. I really, really want to make. And um, they said, yeah, no one else wants it. So, <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah, well, the rest Have of us it. are going to stay in the warm places. Yeah, yeah. Coral reefs and Serengeti. Yeah, that's, that's my bag. That's so funny. Nobody else wants it. Um, Oh, one of the most incredible sequences of the entire series is uh, is the, the the breaking off of the ice and, and uh, the, uh, coming up from the sea below and watching that happen and and we get to see uh, in the in the making of feature which if for those watching at home if you haven't realized if you haven't scrolled all the way down after you get through all eight there's an hour long making of and we get to see how that, that whole piece was captured. Can you talk about what that experience was like? <laughs> it was wild. the most intense experience of my life. It was an amazing thing to see um, and we'd been there well, you'd been there Sophie'd been there for three weeks waiting for this event to happen 24 hour daylight so you just you just hope it won't happen when you're asleep and you're not looking you point the other way um, and we turned up in the helicopter our helicopter was delayed and we got there and yeah it just we got little bits of it and it slowly started to build but it hadn't happened and on the last night we were playing cards just thinking it's over there's half an hour of daylight with the light on the face of it and then all of a sudden it started to move and shift a little bit. And we thought, oh my God, it's actually going to happen. Yeah. And then you saw in the making of, it all happened. And five kilometers of ice exactly. broke away and it's, yeah. yeah. But the making of, you do, what you don't, we don't put the helicopter in shot in the main sequence, but in the making of film, the helicopter's in for scale. And it's like a fly <laughs> on the face, you know, it's just, yeah. and you guys, I mean, like the pilot was... <laughs> John michelle was amazing pilot, amazing pilot. Ah, just chunks you of ice be. flying yeah. off, and he had like a rear view mirror. He's like, "Whoa, ice! Like back up." You can actually see, yeah, you can see because it rises up, it falls, it doesn't fall off the face. Yeah. It snaps off, and the foot is five, six hundred meters deep underwater, and that lifts up. So it's like a mountain appearing out of the ocean. It's quite an incredible thing to see, to be near, and yeah, there was quite a lot of swearing in the making of. <laughs> Well, one of the other things too that was that was amazing watching that is just uh, I wonder Keith, how tuned into you, Keith, when 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 stuff like that's happening across uh, all the different shoots of like we're on day nineteen of twenty and we haven't gotten the thing yet. We're on day twenty of twenty and we don't have the thing. Are you getting updates and you're like we don't have a show? Nobody's getting <laughs> things. They're out there for thirty, forty days. Where are all the things? Are yeah, you it's um, really my job and uh, Alistair, who I work with who are running the kind of show, we will say that we're the guys who have to manage risk. Yeah. Because making wildlife films is like pay, paying off a blackmailer. Because you make one show, and uh, the audience says, yeah, that's great. Now what you got? And so the next time you go back, it's got to be more and difficult. And, and of course, it, the, diff the difficult things haven't been filmed, because they're difficult. <laughs> and so they're more risky. And so each time we do a series, we, we have to go and try and raise the bar, and that becomes increasingly difficult. So what we have to do is place our bets very, very carefully about what, what, what we're going to do. And we knew that the glacier was incredibly important because it, it symbolizes climate change. It does all sorts of things, and you see the role it plays in the final film. Um, but yeah, we kind of heard that it wasn't happening. And, um, <laughs> and then, of course, everyone comes back and, hey, it's fine, don't, don't you worry. <laughs> We had some shoots, though, where they had, people did come back with nothing. Yeah, and we see one of those as well in the making of. And I was curious, like, the not the ratio, but just how often that happens. And uh, do you get stressed in those moments, or is it just it's part of the process? You're, you've got so many irons in the fire that are... Oh, I get stressed. You get... <laughs> really stressed. And, you know, the thing is that, that, that um, I try to go out in the field myself a lot, because what happens if you sit behind your comfy little desk and you send these people off to do all, all this stuff... And uh, they come back with, well, that's not very good. And then you go out in the field again, and day one, you can't find your animal. Day two, no animal. And you think, yeah, this is difficult. And it reminds you of how hard it is to be out, out, out there. Um, and you're sitting behind your desk, you know, you can get, you can get very demanding. Yeah. Uh, how much, when you talk about four years in the making, how much of that four years was just <sighs> waiting? Just, <laughs> just most of it, most of it in the field is waiting. But you kind of now we're trying to create these cinematic sequences. Oh, it's all so there's worth it, yeah. yeah, it's totally worth it. But there's a lot you're building the story the whole time you're there, 
and you're trying to build the story to it, it's engaging. So yeah, there's sometimes there's waiting, but a lot of the time you're animals sleep a lot though, don't they? They do sleep, <laughs> they sleep, most, sleep yeah, more than most us. Of the time. <laughs> more than producers. Yeah, how long did you say you were out there? Twenty four hours daylight. It was was it twenty days, three weeks, or whatever it was before the, everything happened, before you got the shoot that shot on the last day. Oh. You were out there for uh, three just over three weeks camping and oh have a God. shower. <laughs> That's a routine. <laughs> have, like satellite Wi-Fi or something? Or you just going through <laughs> no, BuzzFeed no. lists day yeah. after day? Just no, and you can't take your eyes off the glacier. No, you got to watch it. Because you got to, literally, it's worse than sort of watching paint dry. At least that sort of changes color slightly. <laughs> oh my God, what a weird social experiment. How do you stay sane while <laughs> you're just staring at a wall of white with constant daylight for three weeks at a time? Who said anything about the same? <laughs> yeah. I guess so, right? That's, uh, I made an assumption there. Um, you know, Keith, you mentioned how every time you've got to raise the bar, you've got to do more. And without question, you guys raise the bar on this. Uh, what about, I think one of the things a lot of people assume makes it easier, makes your job easier, is uh, drones. Oh, they'll use drones for everything. I was sitting there, uh, as someone who watches a lot of these, there were sequences where it was like, surely they had a drone for this. Uh, but then I watched the making of, and no, a lot of times it's do, it, it, men and women with cameras on sticks just trudging through the jungle, uh, living in the ice, getting out there and doing it. Uh, is, uh, what technology, let's take drones out of that, what technology has uh, made the job a little bit easier or allowed you to get things that you wouldn't have been able to capture uh, t 10 years ago, five, 10 years ago. Well, Jamie's one to pick up on Yeah, that. I mean, oh, it depends. I mean, obviously, there's lots of different styles of cinematography. Um, the, the things that we filmed for Frozen Worlds and some of the other episodes was taking a gyro stabilized camera from a helicopter, the Cineflex, and putting it on a Jeep, a uh, 4x4, putting it on a snowmobile, and then you're able to be with the animals as they're moving through the landscape. So, wild dogs polar bears for Sophie's show and you can capture images in a way that you couldn't before you had to previously you were just you were stationary they walk past you you pick up your stuff move they go past again so one of the shots that I think of that that so it's the first time that on sea ice we've taken this vehicle with this camera on and there's the beautiful shots at the end of Frozen of um, a blizzard and it was blowing a gale with snow and the, this bear just melts into this white world now, you couldn't do that on a normal camera because the weather is like shaking the camera and you can't, you know, you get you snow on the lens. And it would be, it's, yeah, you'd be it's an impossible shot before to get. And yet we can film this bear in his element, in his world, in this storm because of this weatherproof yeah. system. We're in an enclosed yeah. cabin, so yeah, drinking tea. But, but you, know, you know, people talk about technology a lot, but um, I have to say... Um, I'm at the risk of Jamie putting his rate up. The <laughs> cinematographers are the essence of wildlife film, filmmaking because in our business, you have to, someone has to anticipate what is going to happen in 10 minutes' time. There's no point one knowing what's going to happen in 30 seconds' time because you're in the wrong place and you're not ready for it. You have to really get into the head of the animal, the head of the subject, and make sure you are there and ready to capture it. And that is a skill that, cannot be picked up quickly. It takes years and years of experience. And, and, and then when the thing does happen, you know, you hope they compose it right, it's in focus. You know, they've got to do all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And, um, and me, the producer, well, I just look at it afterwards and say, oh, shit, why is it, why is it out of, you know? I think why do you lose focus there? You know, <laughs> and he's, he's stuck in a blizzard and what have you, polar bear running at him. And anyway, no, but, but that's, that's the... Technology will always help us, but actually it's the, it's the skill of the people on the ground and their knowledge of the natural history that's absolutely crucial to us. 100%. But that's the question for J Jamie. It's like, the, you know, we, ha we go through the stress in the office of setting it up and the risk, but then for someone like you, I mean, the pressure, the cost of the shoot, the pressure is on for that three minutes. I don't think about that. That's a huge... Just in the moment. Well, no, you, you've, got a con you've got a lot to concentrate on. Like you say, you might be... You'd be out there for five, six weeks, and the key part of it, you've built the story, but the key event happens over 30 seconds, two minutes. So you've got to be on it, and you've got to be very calm. I don't know about other operators, but I tend to stay quite calm. But I don't think about the cost of the yeah, budget. Until, until, the producer ruin everything now. <laughs> until the producer next to you says, did you, did you get, get it? it? Well, they say that. They say that, you get it? They say that before it? you've got it, yeah. Yeah, I did. But yeah. Yeah, or they say, as you're getting it, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, you've got to be calm in those situations and you've got to be able to tell the story. And like you say, you're doing a lot, so, yeah. 
Well, nothing really puts that into perspective quite like, not to keep harping on cause the, the, the behind the scenes episode, but you really do, you get this juxtaposition of shots just that were utilitarian shots of here's how we made it versus here's what we got from doing all of that. And like, like I was going to say, when you're talking about the, the composition, the artistic eye, all of that, that is in and of itself a beautiful skill and talent to have that has to sit on the shoulders of all that background knowledge of getting prepared, of getting set up and making sure you're there so you can make Make those artistic calls. Uh, it's it's a really cool complex thing that you're right. No amount of technology can replace that uh, at all. I, I was just very curious to see like what your skills do with the newer tools, and, and this show is is quite a testament to that. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. So, what was it like? You put this whole thing together, and then Sir David Attenborough goes ahead and speaks over it for you. That's got to be cool. The first time you get all that played back, you hear his voice, the narration, the whole nine. That's got to be a fun experience. Uh, I mean, unbelievably, yeah. like <laughs> humble, like having David in a com record, and you're just like pinching yourself the whole time. You're like, D -d -d and it's funny because it sounds like because we're so used to his voice, and he's in recording the script in, in f for the show and you're like, it sounds like telly <laughs> all of a sudden. Yeah, right? It is, it's on the screen there and you're like... <laughs> Do you know, it's, it's interesting with, with David, you, you always kind of think that it's, it's, it sounds so natural and so easy, but each script he does is a huge performance and he, he really works on the script beforehand. He really knows it inside out and the emphasis he puts on every single place is absolutely perfect and, and um, it's a real performance. And if you watch him do it, yeah, he's working at it, and we 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 don't stop him. We let him go, and because um, when he started doing recording, it was all live, so you couldn't you couldn't you you couldn't stop and go back. You couldn't cut and what have you. So they learned that that to to actually had to do it, and um, and so but because he's concentrated so much on the performance and what have you, we let him go through and then we, we can go back and because he's a huge professional, he can drop in and, and, and fill in the gaps. But, um, For the but, but each, 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 each performance and, and on this, I think on this series, he's, he's as good as he's ever been. He really is. And, and um, yeah, the emotion is fantastic. Well, just the, he reads, I was just amazed because the first time I've sort of been through it and just how spot on he is with the emotional delivery. Like you're sitting there thinking, oh, how's he going to read this line? Is it going to be, you know, is he going to be how I want it? And, and it just far exceeds anything you could have imagined. And he just, first time, it's incredible. Yeah, there's a reason he's a legend. Uh, all right, we're going to, in just a second, we're going to go over the audience, but there's something I wanted to talk about, kind of circling back to where we started with it's out in the wild, people are seeing it, people are responding to it. And, and one of the big things everyone's responding to is that really, really rough sequence with the walrus. Uh, walruses? Walrus? I don't know the plural. <laughs> I should be smarter. I've walrus. watched enough of this. Yeah. Um, but. Man, the first time I saw that, I did not see that coming. I, I as you, nobody did, nobody expected that to happen. Uh, putting a sequence like that in the film uh, was there debate. I mean, you have hours and hours and hours of footage. I'm sure there are other sequences that are also harsh and and, and difficult to watch. I mean, nature is metal, but like, <laughs> but that particular sequence, the, there seems to be a significance behind it. The, the reason that it's there, the story, what it's telling for the story. I'm just curious what the conversation was around, rather or not to include it, or or if you knew right away we need to share this. What? what? Um, yeah, of course. You, you film something like that, and you know, a lot of thought goes into how we cut it, how we tell it. Um, I mean, we obviously went with the intention of kind of capturing uh, this extraordinary situation going on in Russia at the moment, which is the loss of sea ice, meaning that, you know, a lot more walruses are hauling out a lot more frequently along that coastline in bigger numbers than they ever have before. Um, but we had amazing backing from Netflix, amazing backing from Keith and Alistair and confidence in the sequence. Um, and then Nigel Buck, who cut it, pretty much the first cut I mean I don't think it changed from the first cut he he cut it he just got it spot on it wasn't you want to show just enough that it's it's not just one walrus falling that you know um so that it's not just a one-off um but you don't want to be too grotesque with it in terms of like upsetting people so I think Nigel did a brilliant job of getting that balance um and we debated it a lot and and Netflix you know were very happy with it from from the cut we showed them and um, yeah, people have been really supportive in kind of telling that message because it's a very important message to get out there. And it's been it's been really great that because you you do worry about what the audience reaction is going to to be, and um, a lot of people you know posting that they 
they're very upset by it. But no one said you shouldn't have shown this to us. Right. No one uh, that I've seen. It's it's so it seems to be that actually, you know, people, which is what our belief was. This is this is a tragedy. This is happening, but this is the world that we have now, and um, yeah. we need to see these things to understand them. Uh, do you ever? Without going too far down the road, but like as just a viewer watching it, I feel helpless watching that moment. And so you immediately go to the website, you look for something you can do. But as documentarians, your job is to not get involved. I can't imagine the, the, the struggle in that moment. There's nothing you could do, even if you wanted to. But you're just standing there watching this happen, and it's, it has to be very difficult. It, yeah. yeah, I it mean... It's heartbreaking. It's I mean, it's a horrible situation to be in, to be there and to see it. But yeah, there's nothing we can do at that moment. It's to upset, bring the story home and show people, tell the world that this it's is happening. the bigger picture, you know, and, and you have to be honest with yourself about that bigger picture. Um, and, you know, the root cause of that bigger picture is the fact that we've got a warming planet um, and the sea ice is, is going and it will in our lifetimes be completely gone in the Arctic and by 2030, they think. Um, so... Whilst it's, I mean, so harrowing watching watching that go on around you, I think we felt some kind of that it wasn't in vain if we can get that story to a, to a broad audience. And I think if people can kind of watch that and learn from that and question it, then that's only a good thing. Uh, last one, Jamie. Do you ever find yourself out there? Have that's got to be at the top of the list. But have there been moments throughout your career where you found it difficult to point a lens at a moment because it was just. I mean, that ex that experience was the most harrowing. I mean, you kind of want to, you, you're trying to document it, so you want to show these shots. You've got to get the shots, so you've still got to do your job, but that, you didn't want to look down the lens. You don't want to be, you know, you don't want to do it, really. That was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, yeah. Well, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go to the audience. We're gonna get some questions. But before we do, remind everyone, uh, it, it, the, Our Planet is on Netflix right now. It is... Ah, it's game changing. Honestly, if you haven't watched it yet, stop wasting time. Go watch it. Uh, it is absolutely incredible. And uh, congratulations, you guys did a, a phenomenal job with this. All right, so Luke, how many we got time for? We got we got one in the room. Fantastic. So let's go. We got a, a microphone in the room. We've got a question right here. Go for it. Hi. Um. So I was wondering, um, is there a moment that sticks out to any of you as the moment that inspired you to pursue a career in documentary work? <laughs> oh, David Attenborough for me. I mean, yeah, seeing I like seeing him on telly and then realizing that that was a job is pretty <laughs> incredible. You know? Yeah, I'd, I'd say, yeah. I, I, we grew up with David Attenborough. I, I think that, yeah. <laughs> there was also this French guy called Cousteau. And when I was a kid, I, I really fancied being on the Calypso and wearing one of those little red hats. <laughs> You're probably all too young to remember that. We can still get you one of those hats, Keith. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. can do it. <laughs> the life is quite <laughs> Yeah. Wasn't there that? There was that movie. Yeah. yeah. Was, uh, was, David, was David a part of it from day one, or was he something you guys, uh, you started the project, and then, hey, we got it. David's in. He's confirmed. Like, how did he come along after? No, well, I, I mean, I started working with David when I was, I was 24, and I worked with him all my career. Uh, and so, you know, we, we, me and Alistair know David very, very well. And we said we had this ambition that we were going to do this big series, but it was going to be, um, it was going to have us, you know, a really strong, it was going to be a series of our time and have a strong message. And David said, yeah, come in. And uh, he did say though, you know, boy, you've got to watch out, you know, I'm, I'm not getting any younger. So if I'm still around, come in. Oh, man. So, um, yeah. It's pretty amazing to have that relationship with, that he would just, yeah, yeah let's go for it. Let's do it. No, he's a fantastic guy. No. I, th I think we just, you know, we're part of the team. And David's part of the, the team, and he, he he always has. But he doesn't. He really inspires us. You, what you don't want to do with David Attenborough is actually go to him with a program that disappoints him, because that's not good. You feel really kind of oh, <laughs> so you kind of make sure it's good. Well, you yeah, you do whatever you can. <laughs> I have to assume uh, he was not disappointed. He, he was. I think he's happy. I think, yeah. yeah you can hear it in his reads. Um, all right, well, we're going to wrap it up. We're just about out of time. <clears throat> but one last reminder, head on over to Netflix if you haven't yet and start watching Our Planet right now, okay? It's an incredible series. Uh, these are incredible people. Uh, do yourself a favor and watch this show front to back. Uh, everybody, please make a ridiculous amount of noise and join me in thanking the great Keith Scully, Sophie Lanfear, and Jamie McPherson for being here. Come on, do it up Thank you. right now. Let's go.